We're recording now. Great. Thank you, Mr. King. Good morning. This is the meeting of the Comprehensive Land Use Plan Committee. Uh, it is August 9th, 2022 um, at 8.35 a.m. And we have a quorum. Um, before we go into our first item on the agenda, can we start off with a, a roll call, Mr. Price? Brent Rubin? Here. Deborah Carpenter? Here. Dustin Bullard? Here. Jasmine Anderson? Jennifer Rangel? Here. Jerry Hawkins? Krista Nightingale? She won't be here today. Linda McMahon? Here. Lynette Aguilar? Matt Houston? Peter Goldstein? Here. Roy Lopez? Here. Seven. And it looks like Miss Aguilar is online. I can see her. I don't know if I heard her. Yeah, I, I see her there. Uh, Lynette Aguilar, can you hear us? Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? Great. All right, the first item on our agenda this morning is the Hensley Field Redevelopment Plan and Mr. Castillo will be, Del Castillo will be presenting. Good morning, Chair Rubin and committee members. My name is Arturo Del Castillo. I'm a chief planner in the city's planning and urban design department and project manager for the Hensley Field Redevelopment Plan. Together with assistant project manager, Don Rains, and on behalf of our department director, Julia Ryan, we are happy to be in front of you this morning after an 18th plus month planning and design process to walk you through the final draft of the Hensley Field Master Plan. The site is a former Dallas Naval Air Station, a 738 acre property in District 3, <clears throat> owned by the city of Dallas and adjacent to Mountain Creek Lake. It represents a unique opportunity to address many of the city's priorities, including the need for additional housing at various price points, strategy-based mobility, and expanding the tax base south of I-30 while creating an equitable, healthy, and prosperous community, incorporating environmentally sustainable solutions. I want to now hand it off to Jim Adams and McCann, McCann Adams Studio and Leah Hales of SWA, our planning consultants, to present an overview of this plan. Thanks so much, Arturo. Good morning, um, commissioners. Uh, we are very pleased here to present to you a summary of the plan. Uh, if you haven't already, I I urge you to go to hensleyfield.com where you'll find the full uh, document. Uh, and what would today is highlight some of the key recommendations of that plan. As Arturo uh, noted, uh, Hensley Field, 738 acres, city owned property, a pretty unique opportunity. Um, its location in the very south uh, west corner of Dallas on Mountain Creek Lake. Uh, a pretty great site, a pretty uh, beautiful site, views of the escarpment uh, and of this waterfront, um, surrounded on two or three sides by Grand Prairie, but also located in the center of the Dallas-Fort uh, Worth Metroplex, uh, really good access from the major freeway system uh, and within uh, reach of, of DART. Um, you know, as a D Dallas Naval Air Station for over 80 years, uh, the site has some unique features. Uh, unfortunately, this gate is no longer here on the upper right, le upper left corner of this, the screen, but there are some many, many uh, artifacts and elements and buildings on the site that have great interest. And uh, we are hoping to preserve many of those. Leah uh, Hales will explain that in a moment. And of course, um, Mountain Creek Lake, uh, we see as a major resource and uh, amenity for this site. But the city at the very outset of the project uh, established the mission, I think Arturo summarized it very well, is to really leverage the value of this city-owned asset to create a plan that achieves broader community objectives related to the three pillars of sustainability, social equity, economic vitality and environmental stewardship. 
and that that is really those are the guideposts that we are using uh, for the plan. Uh, working with our stakeholder and technical advisory group, six guiding principles were established for the for the plan. Um, you can see them here on the screen, and under each of these principles, a series of corresponding goals have been used uh, as a measurement of performance. So as Arturo mentioned, uh, we are at the end of an 18 plus month uh, process. Uh, this has been guided by uh, a technical advisory group comprised of city of Dallas uh, staff from a whole um, diversity of departments led by planning and urban design, but uh, economic development, environmental quality, housing um, have all been, and transportation have all been very active participants in the planning process. We've also had a, uh, and I should also say as part of that technical advisory group, uh, City of Grand Prairie staff, uh, staff from DART, the COG, uh, and other regional agencies have been uh, part of the process as well. In addition to the technical, technical advisory group, we've also had a stakeholder advisory group. We've held numerous meetings with them. This is a, these are representatives of the broader community uh, surrounding neighborhoods, uh, advocacy groups, um, industry representatives uh, have all participated in those, um, in those work sessions. And then we've had several broader community-wide events. Uh, this has all occurred during COVID. So we were fortunate in June of 21 to have a, a on-site discovery tour um, where about 200 folks showed up uh, to tour the site and to help us define some of the priorities in terms of uh, what they felt was important uh, to maintain on the on the site as part of the plan. And then we've had virtual public meetings as well. And we have uh, at key milestones presented to the city council's economic development committee um, and uh, have been keeping them abreast of the plan. So just to give you a quick overview of what the key uh, recommendations of the plan are is to, one is to create a walkable mixed use community and the program that has been established after the 18 month process with pretty much extensive market research is a mixed use community with about 3.7 million square feet of commercial and institutional use and about 6,800 residential units. Uh, An inter interconnected network of open spaces that have a strong orientation to Mountain Creek Lake. Uh, Leah Hales from SWA is going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, historic preservation and adaptive reuse of key buildings and facilities to really tell the story of this site uh, and uh, its role in protecting the country over the last uh, after, last century almost, uh, creating a multimodal transportation system that links to Dallas's high capacity transit network, um, really achieving the city's climate action plan uh, goals with net zero construction, uh, the maximization of renewable energy sources, uh, and the creation of a 40 acre innovation village on the runway peninsula, which we'll describe in a moment. And very importantly, and Arturo mentioned this, is really to ensure that we have a diversity of housing choices uh, with a complete range of housing types and ensuring that 20% of all of these homes have long-term affordability. Um, and uh, we have developed a housing, uh, affordable housing program that is part of the plan that I'd be happy to discuss in more detail. So in terms of the land use economic development uh, recommendations, the plan calls for reserving about 60 to 80 acres of land along the Jefferson Street frontage for one or more corporate or institutional users. The city has reached out to educational institutions as well as medical, um, uh, medical facilities to uh, locate on the site as potential catalyst uses. We are also proposing uh, a full service grocery store, which uh, has been a great need in Southern Dallas. 
Um, we've also talked about the possibility of a film studio complex to be considered as one potential anchor use within that area. Um, 30 to 40% of the homes at Hensley Field are going to be in low to medium density fee simple ownership. Uh, and 20% of all of those homes will be affordable, as I said, to individuals or families earning 80% of uh, AMI or below. And uh, that's for ownership housing. And then 60% of uh, average uh, median income for rental units. Uh, and then one of the recommendations, uh, as you may know, is the Texas Army National Guard currently operates in the very southwestern corner of the site. They have a lease until 2040. Um, what we are uh, encouraging is that initiatives commence to accelerate the relocation of this facility to Fort Worth. And there are already um, initiatives in progress for that uh, relocation. And this diagram really just shows, you know, how that 80 acres might get organized. The US Air Force does have a small campus in this in the very northeast corner of the site. Uh, there are some very significant hangar buildings that could be potentially reused, possibly for a film studio complex. Uh, and then there are the, the ability to create a major campus, one or more campuses, as well as the uh, grocery full service grocery store. Leah Hales from SWA has been our partner in uh, developing the open space uh, program and uh, she's gonna describe that. Good morning, everyone. Um, so part of the goals for this, as Jim mentioned, was to really um, fulfill some of the, uh, the concepts within the CCAP plan. And so as a part of that, we are looking to reserve at least 25% of the site, 185 acres for publicly accessible open space. Now those things happen in various uh, typologies of landscapes. So you've got your programmed open space, your informal non-programmed open spaces, which could include trails, um, ecological corridors, things like that. We have this integrated blue green infrastructure where we're capturing stormwater on site, have it filtrating back into the groundwater system versus just flowing off into the lake. Um, other areas includes a 10 acre site kind of in the center of the plan. Um, I don't know if you can point to a gym. Yeah, for the for a GPISD school because we we are in GPISD district there. Um, but adjacent to that would be a 10 acre kind of open space area for uh, sports facilities and play fields that would be shared through the community. You know, other areas of green space along Jefferson and in the core of the site include um, Blackland Prairie restoration. Um, we've got enough green space to have every resident within a five minute walk uh, to public open space. Um, one of the key areas that we felt very strongly about was reconnecting Cottonwood Bay and back through to Cottonwood Creek in connection to the lake. Uh, this was originally cut off during the expansion of the runway back in the 40s, I guess mid 40s during World War II. Um, and so it's kind of created these two pockets of contamination where water can't naturally flow anymore. And so this kind of reestablishment of that water movement through there is really going to help the overall water quality, we believe, um, on this particular site. Um, other areas, we've got some, you know, kind of programmed, heavily programmed open space around the runway peninsula. We've got two, uh, we've got a marina park, we've got a waterfront district, and then some other kind of pocketed urban parks uh, within the area itself. And we would like to renegotiate the kind of front entrance with the Air Force in order to make a more established, uh, cohesive frontage on Jefferson for the entry into, um, the, uh, into the plan. And then the other thing we've captured is an area of about 18 acres for urban agriculture. Um, it's located on the western side of the property. Um, we, it's part of the CCAP plan for food security, and we do feel that um, this part of Dallas has, is within a food desert, even though the military facility itself can't be 
designated as a food desert since it's now decommissioned, it would be a part of that. Next. So this is a view a rendering just showing like the realignment of Cottonwood Creek and what that would feel like um, kind of penetrating through the site. You know, we'd have these islands of both uh, program spaces, but also maybe just some floating wetland spaces and ecological um, rehabitation in the within that area as well uh, for bird migration, things like that. I think this um, is a very interesting, could be a really uh, fantastic concept. And it also gives us more waterfront edge um, within the, the plan itself. Next. If this is just a concept kind of showing what that esplanade along the waterfront might look like, you know, there may be kayak rental locations, some small lightweight watercraft on the water, um, but also have this kind of mixed use uh, uh, retail um, food and beverage opportunities there on, along the waterfront in Dallas, which Dallas really doesn't have at this time. Next. So transportation and mobility. Uh, we worked with Farron Piers, um, who has worked with the city of Dallas many times in their transportation planning on this project. And so along Jefferson Boulevard, uh, we, there would be three uh, signalized intersections along the frontage there, along with two other ride in, ride out only um, locations. Those intersections are about a thousand feet apart. Uh, we would also look to make connections along uh, Lake Crest on the south uh, west side and then Hardy Road on the south side, kind of connecting those neighborhoods um, back together and then proposing a new skyline road connection across uh, Cottonwood Bay. And we would like for all of these streets or many of these streets to be multimodal. So we would have protected bike lanes um, and low for bikes and low speed devices. You can kind of see in this concept rendering in the median there, we'd be capturing stormwater, um, having these really kind of ecological smart streets um, and um, kind of multi-use mobility. Um, yeah, there you go. So we worked uh, with DART. We talked to DART quite a bit about um, how to get high capacity transit out to the site. You know, one of them was running a BRT line. So one of the, you know, the bus rapid transit line that comes down Jefferson currently um, is one of the highest use transit um, lines within the DART system. So we think a continuation of that BRT into the property here and having at least three transit centers within there is probably the right um, you know, concept for this particular plan. There was talk of potential future light rail uh, possibilities, but that would be something that could happen if it happens would be long-term obviously for this, this property. The other thing is to uh, provide future AV transit, dedicated transit ways so that most residents are within a 10 minute walk of transit um, provide that network of low mobility streets with protected bikeways, as I mentioned, and then implement that complete streets design that prioritizes really, you know, pedestrian uh, walkability, bicycling, all of those kind of things within the, the property itself. Next. So this just kind of shows you sort of those multimodal streets. So you've got the BRT line down the middle there, and then the um, the cars kind of running on each side and then bicycles outside of that. And of course our sidewalk system. And then historic preservation adaptive reuse. So as Jim mentioned, there's many historic um, buildings on this site in, in addition to other elements. I don't know if many of you knew that there is a cemetery on the site that was kind of in play between the mid 1800s to the mid 1900s. Um, you know, having the access now back to that cemetery as it wasn't publicly accessible for these past almost 100 years. Um, some of the things that we would like to do is to kind of preserve and restore the two officer housing uh, uh, buildings that are at the entrance 
into the property there, kind of revitalize those back into a public space, you know, so whether they are um, a small library or a museum or whatever, we're not exactly sure we would work with the Office of Historic Preservation to develop a strategy on how to reuse those buildings. Um, but we do think that they are worth saving. The same with the maintenance hangar and the small arms magazine, things like that, that are, you know, really kind of tells that history of the site. And they're very unique elements. The, the maintenance hangar itself is a, a, is a fantastic structure. It's in a great deal of deterioration, but it could become a really interesting, um, yeah, a public open space, you know, cultural facility, you know, having it open for festivals, events, beer gardens, who knows, it could be any number of things, but, you know, really creating a park and some synergy around it. It's very close to the waterfront also. So having a great connection on both sides of it is going to be key. Um, I mean, this could be a really fantastic uh, uh, use of reuse of this facility. Thanks, Leah. So, um, in terms of sustainability forward, Leah said uh, that a key guiding post for this plan has been the city's climate action plan. Um, and the notion early on has been to establish Hen Hensley Field as a as a kind of living laboratory and a proof of concept for uh, for the climate action plan. A key goal being to achieve uh, gold minimum gold certification under the lead cities and communities platform and certainly as part of uh, the project to establish net zero energy uh, and low carbon healthy materials for all new construction this is a a goal set forth in the climate action plan for 2030 uh, we believe that with the uh, using photovoltaic solar energy as well as the potential for a geothermal heating and cooling loop that we can meet that goal. Um, I think I said earlier that the idea also to develop an innovation village on the runway peninsula, uh, we're thinking that could be with a nonprofit or a corporate sponsor, really as a demonstration project that tests a whole range of state-of-the-art uh, green infrastructure and uh, emerging building technologies. Um, also, recycling compost collection uh, is a goal of the climate action plan, and we would be proposing to establish complete compost recycling systems within the Hensley field development. And importantly, um, as we go to select a future uh, partner or to select one or more corporate or institutional anchor uses, really using uh, ESG criteria, environment, social, and governance criteria to make sure that our partners uh, who uh, assist in implementing the project have the same set of values consistent with the sustainability goals. And this is just an image of what the, the uh, run the innovation village might look like on that uh, 40 acre piece of land projecting into Mountain Creek Lake. So, one of the key issues uh, for this the future of this site is environmental remediation. Um, and the, the good news is that a lot of work has already been done to remediate the site from um, over the past 20 years from uh, the soil contamination. So, uh, contaminants like metals, petroleum, PCBs, uh, semi volatile organic compounds compounds those soil contaminants have been cleaned up on the site and that has all been cleared by the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Groundwater remediation has been partially completed. It's really ongoing. There are a series of monitoring wells there that are monitoring those those contaminants and that can continue um, as development occurs. The major issue that's outstanding is PFAS, that's polyfluoral alkyl substances. Uh, that, those are the, the foams, the firefighting foams that uh, were used by the um, Navy uh, over uh, a couple of decades at least. 
Um, and that is a chemical that it has been found in the soil and the groundwater. The Navy is studying this uh, right now. I understand that they've just recently um, released a report uh, that uh, describes the extent of the PFAS more specifically. And in 2023, they will be completing a feasibility study uh, to assess the different remediation alternatives uh, and uh, hopefully start cleanup shortly thereafter. The Navy has agreed to clean up the site to residential standards and to do that in a way that will not impede redevelopment. So on the call this morning, we have both John Salmon of Terracon, who is part of our consultant team, uh, and Lori Trulson from the Office of Environmental Quality. Both of these folks have been working for the last 10 or 15 years uh, with the Navy uh, negotiating the settlement agreement that uh, was executed in the early 2000s uh, and monitoring the progress of the PFAS cleanup. So they'll be able to answer any specific questions that you might have on the environmental remediation of the site. Um, going on to the phasing of the property, uh, this diagram shows how we see the project progressing over the 20 year period. Um, and our whole financial modeling has been done based on this phasing strategy. The first phase, as you can see here, would concentrate the initial phases of development in the Northeast portions of the site. Um, as I said, really uh, initiating those economic development opportunities along the Je Jefferson corridor and creating the first residential neighborhood along Mountain Creek Lake. We think that this will be really important in establishing the identity of, uh, of uh, Hensley Field um, and creating this really wonderful area or oriented to Mountain Creek Lake. We would also begin in that period of time the um, the exploring the potential for extending the original alignment of Mountain Creek uh, through the site. So this first phase could result in about a thousand dwelling units, uh, including 460 odd single family homes and 550 apartments uh, with almost a million square feet of non-residential uses um, attracted to the site. That would be our goal. So the second phase you can see here moving into the south southern portions of the site um, with another neighborhood again oriented to Mountain Creek Lake and to the diversion channel initiating the innovation village and expanding further the uh, economic development sites along Jefferson. And the final phase really filling out the site with the highest density mixed use uh, development in the core of the site uh, and the development of neighborhoods on the, the existing National Guard, Texas National Guard site along Cottonwood Creek. Uh, altogether, 30, around 3,700 dwelling units and about one, um, altogether about 3.9 million square feet of, uh, of commercial space when it's built out. Now, this slide has a lot of numbers on it, but um, suffice it to say that we've done quite a bit of financial modeling. Uh, economic and planning systems is, was um, our econ economist on the team. Um, we've estimated the total cost of infrastructure in terms of including site preparation, roadways, utilities, uh, the open spaces that Leah described, um, all of the sustainability uh, forward uh, issues. Uh, or elements coming to about $390 million uh, of costs. We've projected the revenues uh, over that same period at about $350 million. So that represents a deficit in, um, in net present value over 20 years of about $78 million. Um, not unusual for a project of this size and scale uh, and with the level of public investment that's going to be required to bring those private uh, uses uh, to the fore. Fortunately, we have ways of, um, of uh, filling that gap. 
uh, tax increment financing, creating a, a tax investment reinvestment tax incentive reinvestment zone on the site uh, is recommended to fund infrastructure uh, and other public uh, benefits of the site. Uh, depending on the level of county uh, involvement, um, that could generate up to um, $198 million of, uh, of value over the 20 year period. So more than enough to cover the, um, the gap that I described earlier. The other idea that has come up in this uh, planning process has, has been to explore the idea of creating Hensley Field as a sub-district of the Cypress Waters TIF district, uh, which would be able to use some of the tax increment generated from Cyper Cypress Waters on this site. And then there are other financing tools that uh, are being discussed as well, a municipal management district or a public improvement district, and then pursuing environment and energy grants as well. And then finally, in terms of governance, um, what our recommendations in the plan are is to select a master developer partner uh, to negotiate a master development agreement that would define specific responsibilities for both the public and private sectors. Uh, the master developer would be charged with securing private investment capital and to craft a public private financing structure. They would be uh, charged also with the executing hor the horizontal infrastructure elements, that's the streets, the utilities, the parks, managing the sale and development of real estate for residential commercial development. What's not on this bullet would also be managing the affordable housing program as well, ensuring that we achieve the 20% um, long-term affordability goals of the plan. Um, so the master developer would be selected through a competitive RFQ, RFP process managed by the Office of Economic Development. Uh, they would, uh, the successful uh, master developer would enter into an exclusive negotiating agreement uh, with the city uh, prior to, uh, that would basically establish the, the terms for negotiating the master development agreement. And, um, the other key recommendation is that the, uh, the city establish a de dedicated multi-departmental staff team to negotiate and implement the, the plan over the 20 year period. And there are some very similar public private partnerships that we have drawn on to make these recommendations. The Miller development in Austin, um, the Stapleton now called central park development of an old airport, uh, of, Denver's passenger airport uh, in, uh, in Denver and also the Mission Bay project in, uh, in San Francisco. All examples of project, public private projects that have involved master developers. And that summarizes what we have today. There's a lot more detail that we could get into on any of these topics and uh, we really welcome your, your questions. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Adams. Um, just for the record, real quickly, um, I wanted to note that Mr. Houston arrived at 837, and I saw Mr. Anderson, or Commissioner Anderson here at 851, though it may have been earlier. Um, so if we could just have that noted for the record, that would be great. With that, do any of the members have questions for city staff or the consultants? Mr. Carpenter. Yes, I have a question about the future of the lake, because my understanding is that the lake is, uh, you know, it's not city owned, it's privately owned and its ownership is coupled to the uh, utility power plant uh, that plans to uh, be decommissioned or decommission itself over the next few years. Is Dallas going to have a guarantee that they're going to, I mean, obviously this it seems apparent to me that it would be marketed as a lakefront community as is, is Dallas going to be guaranteed access to it and then also coupled in with that um, understanding that the um, Air Force, the military has remediated the pollution on the Hensley Field site itself. Um, I would assume there are also environmental issues with the lake. Um, so could, I don't know who would answer that question, but anyway, about the, the, um, yeah, I can, the lake. I can start and then maybe John and Lori and uh, Leah could, could, um, 
expand. Uh, the lake is owned by the um, tech. It's called TextGen. They are the current owners of the power plant that's across the lake. We have had discussions with them. What they have told us is that the power plant itself will be de decommissioned probably within the next five years. Uh, their goal for their site is not unlike what the city's goal is for this site, and that is to redevelop the property. Uh, as part of our plan, we have recommended that the city negotiate with uh, TextGen to uh, establish agreements for use of the lake, uh, and uh, whether that uh, what that entails exactly is uh, yet to be determined, but that would occur uh, in tandem with the negotiations with the master developer. Uh, in terms of the contaminants with the lake, I'm going to let um, John Salmon or Lori uh, talk about that um, and what restrictions there might be on the, on the lake. John, do you want to take that over? Sure. Um... As far as the water goes, the, the, there have not been um, contaminants uh, detected in the actual water itself. There is some uh, sediment contamination uh, within the sediments in Mountain Creek Lake and the Cottonwood Bay area um, that would likely require some additional cleanup if that um, if the uh, original Cottonwood Creek was to be restored, uh, just in, in order to prevent disturbance of those contaminated sediments or distribution of those contaminated sediments outside of uh, where they currently um, are located. Uh, as of right now, uh, the uh, TCEQ has determined that the sediments as they are in place now are acceptable. Uh, that they've the contamination has been buried to a sufficient degree to be protective of the lake um, and some uh, dredging of some contaminated sediment was done oh gosh probably about four years ago now um, and uh, that was to meet the tcq requirements uh, for the sediments that had not been buried that were contaminated But it, it, you know, the as far as use of the lake goes, um, Jim, if I'm not mistaken, um, uses were going to be more of a uh, surface water use, but with uh, boats, uh, things of that nature. Right. It wouldn't really be swimming beaches or anything of that nature uh, as as a result of all of this. Um, and then uh, there are fish consumption advisories on the lake as of right now. Uh, by Texas Parks and Wildlife, and um, those would probably continue uh, for some time until um, the, 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 the uh, I guess it's the owner of the DGIC, which is next to the Dallas Global Industrial Center, which is next door, which is former Navy-owned property. Uh, they are required to go in and do periodic fish tissue studies to evaluate how the fish are responding uh, to contamination over time. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. So you're anticipating that the recreational use of the lake would be similar to what's available at White Rock now? Correct. That's our, yeah, that's our hope um, and, and our expectation. I mean, even White Rock Lake has, uh, has water quality issues uh, as well. So yes, the idea here is modeling this very much after the recreational role that White Rock play, plays in West Dallas. Um, and having this as a as a real amenity for the southern Dallas area, East Dallas. East, I'm sorry, East <laughs> Dallas. Questions? Okay. Other members, do you have questions for the consultants or city staff? I see a hand, Commissioner Anderson. Yes, actually, I hadn't put it up yet, but I was planning on putting my I thought hand I saw up. It. I well, you I did, have. so I could go ahead and take advantage if you if you like, or I could um sure you. sure we'll go to Miss Brown Hall after that. Okay. Um. Yeah. So a, a, a couple things, um, and and these are questions. I'm concerned about the projected revenue deficit that we're showing, and and I know that we are looking at several tax credits and other incentives that could potentially cover those deficits. 
I'm wondering how how specific are we planning on going with with those specific um, incentives um, in terms of I know you mentioned tax increment financing and creating some um, TIF boundaries in this area that then would help out a lot. Uh, I'm wondering, is there an opportunity at creating a new markets tax credit eligible area um, that would really help those numbers go a little bit north of of of, of red? Um, at the same time, you you mentioned um, a few historic structures, and I'm wondering if there are historic tax credits and things that would be associated with those. I know they're not in an historic area or a designated area, but is there an opportunity to create a designated area since this is a 20 year or so um, outlook that then would be able to take advantage of historic tax credits? And yes. then, um, yeah, we can, if you can answer those, I got two more questions and then I'll be done. Uh, yeah, the revenue deficit, um, I mean, we looked at comparable projects and this kind of deficit is not uh, unusual at all. I mean, it's, uh, you know, a deficit of $70 million is very typical of, of that range is typical for a project like this. And we will certainly be looking at the possibility of new markets tax credits. Uh, I'm not the economist, so I can't, I can't speak specifically to that. I can say that historic tax credits certainly could be a possible for, for instance, a an institution or a, de a developer looking to um, redevelop the uh, maybe hangar that Leah described could certainly be eligible for tax credits. So, uh, so that that's very much an opportunity. Um, tax increment financing, we think, and we've talked at, at length with the um, the economic development folks at the city. Um, we feel that that is probably a really positive way of uh, covering any gap and to help helping uh, to fund infrastructure as well as the housing uh, components of the site, the affordable housing program. Who would be responsible for identifying and executing the financial strategy of all of these, the syndication of all of these various elements? Well, the, um, the city's economic development department uh and the future master developer would be uh basically responsible for implementing the whole financing plan so what we while we this plan is identified the possible tools the master development agreement that the city enters into with the master developer will will basically uh define those in much more specific terms understood understood is there a role that the, in addition to the Economic Development Corporation, is there a role for the Public Facilities Corporation or projected role that they may be able to um, project some of the portions of the project in order to gen generate kind of unrestricted revenue for the city through the uh, PFC? We could get back to you that I'm not familiar with the Public Facilities Corporation um, and that has not been discussed as part of this uh, of the implementation program, but we could, um, I could try to get an answer to that question. Okay, and then my last question is about sustainability and code generation. Um, is there? I, I do know that we are um, enacting the climate goals, and and there's a measure of sustainability here. But I'm wondering if, um, in terms of the technology that's involved, um, will there be forward leaning co generation opportunities um, that are kind of diverse, you know, in, including natural gas? I know we we're on, on a shell, um, a shell slope here for gas. We also, well, so yeah, are there any opportunities at co generation in, in various ways? Yeah, we'd have to look at, um, we haven't talked specifically about cogeneration. We have talked about, as I mentioned earlier, geothermal um, as being uh, something that we think has really strong potential here, particularly for heating and cooling. Um, cogeneration is uh, is possible. I know that the Miller development in Austin has done that with natural gas. Um, the climate action plan, though, is 
uh, calling for electrification. And so use of natural gas may not be consistent with the goals of the climate action plan. Um, well, but we still may, um, in terms of solar panels, geothermal, um, and, and also active buildings, we, it, would there be a plan for, and I'd imagine the master developer and the subsequent architects would then put these into play, but would there be some criteria for regulating the energy efficiency of buildings or carbon neutrality? Absolutely, yes. And uh, that will be put in place. Uh, we are basically mandating carbon neutrality, uh, just as the climate action plan did. Uh, so we will be basically requiring that of any builder or vertical developer on the site as part of the uh, as part of the agreement. So that will be achieved hopefully, you know, through um, through solar energy, uh, through a possible geothermal loop. Uh, and other methods that uh, could be brought to bear. This, these technologies are rapidly um, progressing uh, and the costs are coming down. So we're confident that this can be done, you know, within the, the time frame that the Climate Action Plan has set forth. So I'd like to say that I, I, this is an incredible plan. I think you guys have approached this in stellar fashion. Um, it seems to have a lot of inputs and components that we would like to see in an emerging area, which is where this is, um, is, is beginning to go. Um, and, and I think that it's, it's, it really looks like it's on a good path and I appreciate the good work that you guys and your team have been doing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll go to Ms. Rangel next. Great. Thank you. And. Thank you to the presenters as well um, for the presentation. And I, it's very exciting um, to see all the different innovative, innovative ideas kind of coming together to a place that's been untapped. Um, my question is, could you all go back to the slide that shows the different phases, please? It's like three yes. phases. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, could you point on phase one where the current Texas Army National Guard is located for me, please? Okay, got it. Um, how do they use their um, their land? I'm just thinking about potential noise, um, other concerns you might have. Yeah, so actually we have a slide, and I think it's in the plan itself that shows the decibel ratings right now. Um, they the, National Guard, just to give you a background, they operate a uh, helicopter. It's um, these uh, Chinook. Chinook. Chinook, thank you. Chinook helicopters uh, on the site. And the, the decibel rating is basically up to 60 dBs all the way to uh, where we're showing the cut through of Cottonwood Creek. So putting residential development on this portion of the site as when that is occurring, that operation still occurs, is not really something that would be desirable. So that's why the first phase is concentrated where it is in the northwestern portion of the site. Um, the site, uh, in addition to the Chinook operation here, uh, the site is also a training area for National Guard folks. So on a weekend, there might be 200, 300 people uh, coming to the readiness center, which is located, you know, right in this location here. Um, so there have been discussions with the uh, Texas um, military department and uh, with Texas National Guard to relocate this facility to Fort Worth. And there is already a hangar facility identified there. Um, and they are working out the details of that. Uh, and so we are, hopeful that by the second phase, the six to 10 years, that that operation will be uh, off the site and in, in that new location in Fort Worth. And all of the, uh, it's all now moving in that direction, um, but the funding has not been completely secured. Got it. And that's helpful. I was just thinking how that played out in this phasing. Um, so if, they weren't to relocate by phase two, you all wouldn't start basically phase two, right? That would be the hiccup. Or or phase two might go in a different place. You know, it might concentrate itself. This is one 
scenario about how the phasing might work and what we've based the financing on, uh, but it could happen in a different pattern. It'll be market driven. Understood. Um, and my last question is for phase one, um, does the city have any leads for the non-residential uses like the commercial uses? Um, well, we know we have strong interest on the part of the film industry to locate here. Um, we have had some interest from um, educational institutions, and I think the city will will uh, you know as this as we proceed reach out to those those kinds of catalytic uses. Um, we would love to see a healthcare facility you know on this in this part of the city, uh, and so I know the city has been proactive in trying to reach out to different institutions like that, and we've looked at. Um, Similar projects, the one in Denver, the one in Austin, um, all kind of attracted those types of uses early on that really helped to spur um, the economic development of the site. Great. Those are all my questions for now. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Lopez? Sure. Uh, Mr. Adams, first and foremost, uh, congratulations on this awesome plan. Um, you know, especially with the city having site control. Uh, many of these things can be accelerated quite rapidly. So really excited about that. But I had a question about, uh, was there any discussion of expanding the scope of the area plan east uh, to incorporate the adjacent areas that are you know, east of, of Ensley Field that includes perhaps the largest conglomeration of auto salvage yards in Texas? Yeah. And do you really feel like these auto salvage yards could impede potential development at Hensley Field. It's like you can't address one without addressing the other, in my opinion. So I want to get your thoughts on just the environmental issues east, just the aesthetics east of Hensley Field, I think could, could put, in my opinion, could potentially preclude uh, development. So just wanted to get your thoughts on that and what you think could happen to these auto salvage yards. And just look at just looking at a quick look at Google Maps, you can see the enormity and the literally looks like millions of cars uh, just sitting and rotting out into the bake sun. Just want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's uh, you know I, we have some challenges around this site. You know, visually, land use compatibility issues. Um, the the thing, the experience that we've had is that a project of this scale, uh, 738 acres, it has the potential of creating its own kind of market and its own identity. And so, yes, uh, we really want to enhance what this site looks like along the Jefferson Corridor. Um, we want to really maximize the uh, the potential of Mountain Creek Lake as the as the real feature of the site and so on. And so, but we also, as you point out, recognize the need for future redevelopment and mitigation of these other sites, some of which are owned by uh, federal government. Um, the, the Marine Corps uh, has a facility imme immediately to the uh, east of us. Uh, and then, as you said, those large sites. I think between Hensley Field, the possible redevelopment of the power plant, I think that the, they will create the catalysts for those sites to change. And I think it, it has to happen kind of incrementally. Um, I think certainly a, a plan by the city to look at those areas uh, would be timely at this point. Um, but I think our focus has really been on city owned land. We're not um, at this point dealing with uh, the other land uh, owners. But I think if you look at what's happened again in Austin, which the project we've been very much involved in, um, the land use patterns around the old airport in Austin have dramatically changed, um, changed the whole nature of, uh, of that part of Austin. Um, when we started the project 20 years ago in Austin, uh, developers told us no one would want to live in that part of the city. Um, the, the 
the transformation of that airport property, 700 acres similar in size to Hensley Field, changed the whole um, dynamic of the area around the airport. And we think the same thing will happen here over the 20 or, or 30 year time frame. We think that the city of Dallas has a real opportunity to use Hensley Field as a, a catalyst for the redevelopment of all of those sites and for economic investment in this part of the city. But certainly it is, a, your point is a good one. I mean, we do have challenges with the kind of land use patterns that immediately surround the site. Thank you, appreciate it. Members, additional questions? Mr. Carpenter? On the same subject, you know, all of the adjacent industrial zoning is not owned by the city of Dallas. Some of it's within Grand Prairie's um, city limits. Uh, right. Uh, is there any concern about the industrial adjacency on the west side? I see that you have a, I just say, 18 acre urban agriculture. I'm assuming that was situated to give some buffering to this new project from uh, what looks like a massive uh, warehouse distribution facility. Correct. We actually showed a hundred foot um, revegetated forest, reforested edge on against the the DGIC site, and then and put our urban agriculture just in board of that. The urban agriculture was placed um, just based upon that there was no soil issues at all, and never had been within that portion of the site. So we kind of located it there just to be on the safest um, side of any, you know, potential contamination issues. But yes, yeah, so we have planned for really trying to uh, buffer that entire area. You know, a lot of this site is going to benefit from rehabilitation of trees. So we're looking to get that 40% tree coverage that's per the Texas Trees Foundation and within the Climate Action Plan as well for urban heat island reduction. And a big chunk of those are going to go along this border here. And I'll just add to you on the car, um, the Copart areas of Dallas, or that are actually in Grand Prairie, you know, a lot of that area is floodplain. And I do believe that the city of Grand Prairie will start to redevelop those, uh, that industrial corridor along Jefferson um, as this project comes on board and becomes a catalyst for redevelopment within the zone itself, but there is a lot of floodplain issues within uh, that Jefferson area. Thank you. Okay, please. Um, are you anticipating in your financial projections that there are going to have to be um, substantial incentives paid to either a, um, a an anchor corporate tenant or a, a full service grocery store? Because I know grocery stores tend to like to be in the middle of a donut of solid, you know, residential development, and here you've got some obstacles with the lake and the um, the military installations and um, industrial property. And uh, as your report stressed, the major developer interest in this area has been warehousing and industrial uses, and the corporate campus type developments have preferred to go north. So is that part of the financial projection or are you anticipating any unusual difficulties in landing a, um, a major corporate tenant? I know I did go to the Miller project and uh, one of the differences there is because of its location right off uh, 35, you're able to jumpstart the project right away with adding, I guess what you could call a regional retail component, but you're not going to have that um, possibility here. Right. Um we have, I think that what the economists have done is they, they have not, they have basically factored in a significant portion of that 60, 80 acres uh, as a nonprofit type of use. So that has been, that has been figured into the um, financial modeling. Um, we know that it is going to be challenging attracting a full service grocery store here. But we think that location that we've identified on this site is probably the, the best one that we can. It's uh, you know on the busy Jefferson corridor, um, and there may well need to be some uh, incentives to attract a use of like that here. So that that is certainly open as part of the process. That will get negotiated in more detail. Um, basically, as part of the master development agreement. 
um, you know, the city can require, the, the, the city will ask, as the plan is saying, that the master developer has to do due diligence and to make every effort to attract a grocery store to the site or to attract, you know, a major catalytic use to the site. So over the next five years, that would be a major activity that will happen, um, you know, at the very beginning of the of the process. And that's that's really what happened in Austin at the Miller development. Um, in fact, the city attracted the the hospital to Miller even before the development agreement had been executed. That's our hope that that something like that could happen here as well. Thank you. Okay, please continue. Um, could someone please um, elaborate on the strategies to include uh, an affordable ownership um, component for housing? Yeah, uh, the city of Dallas, we've you know done a lot of multifamily you know, rental affordability, but I haven't seen much movement on uh, an ownership uh, component. Yeah, we are working with the housing department now to. Um, Put a little more detail of that, but basically, if you look at the plan, what we are recommending, first of all, is that overall 20% of all of the homes will be part of the affordable program. The plan also says that a minimum of 40% of those homes need to be for sale as part of a for sale program. Um, that could be up and a minimum of 40% need to be in the rental program. So there's that 40 to 60% split. Um, what we are recommending is a community land trust that would be operated by a nonprofit um, yet to be defined, uh, but certainly um, some a shared equity or community land trust that would uh, secure affordable uh, the for sale program for a period of 40 years or beyond. Um, and uh, that's been done in at Miller in Austin through not as a community land trust, but as a shared equity program. Um, and we can get into a lot more detail on that, but basically that nonprofit would be funded by a transactional fee uh, on every sale, um, commercial and residential sale. Um, and uh, that they would be able to that nonprofit would be able to uh, coordinate with uh, eligible candidates to uh, to buy homes, uh, and then to there would be a shared appreciation so that that owner would be guaranteed a certain amount of appreciation every year, but the foundation or the nonprofit would have right of first refusal to repurchase the home and to keep it into the affordable program. The goal uh, in our plan is to distribute that housing uh, throughout the development so that there is no kind of physical, uh, you can't really tell where the affordable home would be. It would be uh, integrated within the entire community. Uh, that is something that has been done in the Austin, in the Miller development as well. Um, and then, so in addition to community land trusts, there are other methods. Uh, we will require the master developer to administer the affordable program as well. And so ensuring that uh, the rental properties provide a portion of those rental units as affordable, that could be with cross subsidies. Uh, and then also there is potential for tax credit uh, projects as well. So uh, possibly senior, uh, a senior development or a workforce housing development as well. So the goal would be to distribute that housing throughout the entire development uh, and for that housing to, um, so, so the, for the 20% of those homes to be across the entire spectrum of single family detached and multifamily homes. Thank you. Anything? Yeah, I've got two more. Anybody else? Um, yeah, let me hop to some of the folks sure. online and I'll come back to you. Ms. 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 McMahon? Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I um, have toured Hensley, and I'm super excited about the opportunities it presents for the city of Dallas. I also have been 
involved with Miller Development financing affordable housing in the Miller Development and senior housing in the Miller Development, so very familiar with uh, what's happened there as well. I actually go to the Thinkery in the Miller Development. That's with right my grandchildren. So <laughs> I know, it's lovely. It's uh, it's a great, it's it's not quite the Perot Museum for families, but it's definitely a place to take toddlers when you need to entertain them in the heat in Austin. Um, and I also <laughs> worked in the Stapleton Airport, Airport Development Redevelopment. And so I know and have seen what can actually, the power of these redevelopments can provide. Uh, to answer a question what the commissioner had regarding public facilities corporations, definitely the housing component, the affordable housing component would be able to take advantage of the PFC. Um, and then to uh, the question about the community land trust, I have spoken to David Nagora with the head of housing about a CLT structure in this area. And we are actually, our organization's working on a community land trust backbone organization. Um, and that is hopefully something that will help anchor community land trusts throughout the city. So he feels like this is a high opportunity area for CLT and I, I, cannot, uh, I cannot agree more. Uh, my questions really uh, are related to timing. I had was under the impression when I toured Hensley last year that um, they were going to release the RFP last year, and I thought they had, were in that process. Can you tell me where they stand on the release of the request for proposals from potential developers? So th I'm, I'm going to let Arturo answer that, but uh, just so there's no confusion, there was an RFI uh, that the city put out last year for interested parties for the kind of catalyst uses. The, the RFP for the master developer uh, will not occur until the city council adopts the plan, which we expect is going to be in September, October. But um, Arturo, do you wanna to respond to, to that more specifically? Yeah, I think that's essentially right, Jim. Uh, when the plan gets adopted, we had anticipated about a year's time or so um, for that contract agreement to be had with that master developer. So, so the RFP will be um, sent out somewhere after the plan is adopted. Um, we can anticipate uh, maybe a four to six month process for that to happen. The second question I have. Um... In terms of timing, obviously, you'll get requests and there'll be a time frame out of that. Considering we are now planning for the next bond election, what is the anticipation to particularly in the infrastructure investment that needs to occur in the area? Um, any anticipation of including this project within the next bond? And is that something that would be beneficial? Uh, yes, we're absolutely doing that. We are working with the office, uh, the bond office here internally and having those initial early discussions. Um, it's in their, um, I guess, work program. Um, so it has been identified and we just need to work out the details on that. And then the last question I have really um, has to do with who at the city is going to be in charge of um, kind of shepherding this opportunity because it's um, a huge project and uh, phase one alone is going to, I think, going to provide enough housing density that would actually attract a grocer or some small retail operators. So I'm, I'm not as worried about that as I am in other parts of the city because when you have no, new and shiny and density, um, uh, grocery stores love that. Um, so what's, uh, is there a team? Is there a person who's going to be responsible for really making sure that this stays front and center for the opportunities for the city of Dallas? Yeah, that's um, a good question. We, we have been discussing a multi-departmental team that has yet to be named, um, but we know that that's one of the key things that we'll need to do to make sure that this plan doesn't just sit on the shelf and, and it does get implemented. That's all I have. Thank you very much. So Mr. Houston's hand, then we'll come back to you, Commissioner Anderson. Thank you. Um, one amazing presentation. Um, 
with with this with this development on on a lake that's on the other side of the city that we can uh, we as a community can 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 use and and be able to to benefit from. So thank you for this presentation. My question, uh, a lot of my questions were addressed um, um, in terms of um, uh, the CLT as well as some of the financing for Phase One. I do want to have another, I have a quick question um, for the phase one of housing that you have. And looking at this slide, I'm assuming it is the housing group that is the lowest, right? Exactly. Um, what is your plan? What exactly is your plan? In your presentation, you said you were creating, you will create a market stock um, that's desirable for development of the land. What is your vision um, for the single family compared to the, the multifamily that you have? Just, I guess, north of that property. So I'm not quite sure what you're asking, but we are, in terms of the single family, um, we're proposing a, it, they're all going to be very small lot, uh, missing middle type of housing. So we're talking about um, a lot of attached townhouse clusters, um, uh, some detached, uh, possibly zero lot line type of development, um, really looking to create a level of density here, but one that will be attractive to the market. Um, and we think that this initial location on the lake, uh, kind of away from some of the other adjacent land uses that, uh, that are not all that compatible, we think is the ideal place to begin the project. And then if you go from that neighborhood we also think there's potential for higher density residential, uh, even as part of that first phase, like there could be apartments, um, even condominiums, uh, stacked flats that could be part of that whole first phase neighborhood. So building up in density as you go away from the lake and into the core of the project. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Anderson, I think you had a, another question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this question is related to the area surrounding the sandbox and how we typically approach development. Um, oftentimes we're in a, in, a, in a residential area and an industrial company would wanna come in and build something. This is a little bit opposite of that. So I'm wondering, has there been conversations with the communities that surround this parcel? And what have those conversations sounded like? Um, we've had some general conversations, uh, with the adjacent landowners, um, and we've had no resistance, if that's what you mean, to the idea of creating this mixed use community here. Um, we are also trying to be respectful of those uses as, as Leah, uh, pointed out, we're creating these buffer zones adjacent to those areas. Uh, we're trying to locate appropriate land uses adjacent to those areas. So, um, you know, we believe we, we have addressed those compatibility questions in a way that, um, is going to be suitable, uh, for that new development. It seems like, um, there, there, there has been some consideration, but there's an opportunity at, at creating some, some give and take with the existing community. Um, because there are hard lines of trees and roads that are around the site and adjacent to them. So it, it could conceivably be seen as an affront to what their current lifestyle is in terms of those businesses. But I'd like to see some sort of um, conversation happen between that, that creates, that blurs the buffer line and it, it encourages um, the uses at those facilities to come on to this site or or to have some structure. Um, and, and I think that's a good opportunity in order to help create that live, work, learn, play for the existing community. Um, also, there is an abundance of houses, um, single family homes, and has there been consideration to what will happen to their tax rate once we build this in terms of um, their property values will increase 
Um, and are there amenities and things that the surrounding community can take advantage of that now would be placed in this development? Well, to answer that question first, yes. I mean, the whole notion here is to create with this 185 acres of open space, a network of parks and, and uh, greenways that will really be attractive to the surrounding areas of Grand Prairie and Dallas. So that is definitely a key idea here. Um, in terms of your point about blurring the, the edges, you know, I think, you know, we certainly, um, there has been really no interest on the part of any of our stakeholders to extend the warehousing of uh, you know the DGIC property into the area, but there have been the idea of doing larger scale R and D type uses, uh, which we think would be very compatible with the DGIC warehouse facility. Um, that is kind of a notion that we've uh, we're proposing. It could be like the film, um, the studios. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a kind of transitional use that we think is appropriate. And then if you look at this corner of the site, we have the Air Force, uh, which will be immediately, which would stay, could stay on the site for the entire life of the project. And that's adjacent to the existing um, military use of the, of the adjacent property. So we've, we've tried as much as we can to blur those lines, as you suggest, but to do that in a way that creates an appropriate transition from those types of uses to the kind of urban mixed use pattern that we're proposing within the heart of the site. We appreciate those efforts. I, I think those go a long way. Um, my last question is related to the existing federal facilities. Um, is there an opportunity at adaptive reuse in partnership with those federal agencies to um, redevelop those structures into compatible or even better uses with them still being um, controlled by that federal agency. Um, in other words, trying to use their money to de develop that site as opposed to um, another source of funds. Well, um, in terms of the on site within the, the 738 acres that the city owns, there are no real federal facilities. And we have the Texas National Guard that owns some hangar buildings down in the south um, southwest corner of the site. And then we've got the Air Force that uh, has some facilities here. I can say that none of those facilities, maybe there might be one or two hangars that might have some adaptive reuse potential, but really uh, there are no great federal facilities on our site that that have great adaptive reuse potential. I don't know, Leah, if you want to expand on that. Nope, that's all. Those are uh, my questions. I appreciate your answers and for the team and for this great presentation. I think this will be epic for our part of town. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Carpenter? Uh, yes, I have a uh, question about the open space, uh, about any I guess guarantee of long term maintenance of and access to the open space. Is it the intention for um, some of this open space to be official Dallas City parks? Um, or is it going to be uh, maintained by the you know, master developer, the project itself? Because I know I, I certainly see tendencies when you have homeowners associations or some private entity responsible for maintaining. Uh, these kind of spaces, there could be a tendency to want to cut off public access once they feel that they're they're paying for it. So, what is the plan here? And let Leah, do you want to start that? Well, we have met with um, Dallas Parks and Rec out there with the entire department. We took them on a tour of the site, kind of explained the vision. Um, we do feel that much of this will be uh, Dallas um, Park space probably all of it, that's the real intention is that it is publicly accessible open space for all you know, residents of Dallas um, to come to. Uh, we do, however, feel that because of you know, maintenance costs of many of these program um, public spaces, that a lot of that would probably be like a public-private partnership with adjacent entities here, Similar to how we work with the Katy Trail or Parks for Downtown Dallas, things like that, 
that there might be a private entity that's helping to both build and maintain these park areas, but they still are part of the Dallas park system. Yeah, and you know, I think we're um, building off what has happened in Austin because we have at the Miller development, again, very similar scale, not quite as much open space as being proposed here, but uh, some of that, all of it, as Leah said, is publicly accessible and that is written into the development agreement. So there's no possibility that that open space will get closed to, to the broader public. Even the pools within the neighborhoods are uh, administered by the, the city and are open to the public. However, the operation and the maintenance costs are borne by the property owners association. Uh, the city does contribute a share of that typical to what they would do in other parts of the city, but the additional costs because of the premium nature of the open space and the level of maintenance that's required is funded through the property owners association. And as Leah said, there may be other ways of, of funding that as well, like, like the private sources um, that she mentioned. Anything further? I just have one uh, small question, I guess, about uh, transportation, because I know someone alluded to the bus rapid transit on Jefferson as being one of the most heavily um, traveled segments of, of DART, but that would be considerably to the east of this project. Um, not that this project wouldn't change the, the dynamics entirely, but uh, I, I can't anticipate, I mean, I can't picture at the moment there being rapid transit along Jefferson with those acres and acres of park south of Charlotte. Yeah, and I think that um, what DART has told us is that they feel that this has good potential for uh, extending BRT in the future, probably in this, by the second phase of development uh, when there are enough households here and when, when there's other redevelopment activity that is going on in the area. But, um, but yeah, as, as Leah pointed out, I mean, the, the Jefferson Corridor is the, is, has the highest transit use of any bus route uh, within the city. And so the, the goal is to extend that from, um, what's the transit center, Leah Co Cockrell Hill? Uh, yes. Yes, to, um, to Hensley Field. I guess I have one follow-up. Go, go ahead. Sorry. I guess this is for the staff with the proposal of what I'll call a barbell tip, tip between Cypress Waters and Hensley Field, because they're like, what, 30 miles apart, 40 miles apart? I don't know. I know we we jumped the Trinity with the sports arena tip going over toward Trinity Groves, and I think there's maybe been another, but is that something that is, is uh, being looked at seriously or has a pathway forward? Yes, uh, those conversations have been happening with the Office of Economic Development, and uh, that is the direction we're heading for uh, District that Folks online, any additional questions for the consultants or staff? Absolutely. This is Pat Aguilar. Can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Awesome. And first of all, like my colleagues have said, phenomenal work and plan. It's incredibly impressive, and I appreciate the discussion. And I'd like to learn a little bit more about. Um, how are we providing for the families that are in these lower income housing, right? Are we setting up access to programs? Are we working with nonprofits? Anything outside of the school to change the trajectory for these students' lives? Um, are there, you know, the rec centers, you know, sports, different activities, mentorship? What's the intentionality behind supporting the children outside of the school district? I can start with that. I know that um, a role, I, I mentioned that uh, we're recommending that a nonprofit of some type operate the affordable housing program. That nonprofit can take on a lot of roles, including the kind of support roles that you're describing, coordinating with the school district for after school um, programs or uh, um, education related uh, support. Um, also, they can take on a role of um, 
ownership coaching. I mean, coaching folks about how home ownership works and, and uh, getting people ready to enter into the affordable program. So there are a lot of programs that they can take on beyond just administering the affordable housing program. We have not outlined that in detail yet, but uh, that is something that certainly can be done here. Um, you know, if we want to promote social racial diversity here, there needs to be a proactive program to reach out to those folks, to bring them in and to really help them be successful uh, in terms of acquiring property, purchasing homes, and then also uh, having a lifestyle that is going to be productive. And, and so that, that all can get defined as part of a nonprofit, depending on what you know, the, the broader goals of the community are. Yeah, I appreciate that, Jim. And I think that's important to put pen to paper on what the expectations of that nonprofit should be. And to your point, um, some, I mean, the, this committee exists largely to handle the disparity that comes from, um, you know, racial disparity is a big part of why we're even here. So I would love to see that thoughtfulness. And to your point, I was thinking about the students. I love your point about we've got to work with the parents as well. But some real intentionality around what those programs are expected to be and required of that nonprofit or group of nonprofits, if there's several that need to band together to make an impact. Um, but I think we'd be doing a major disservice if we did not take that approach um, and certainly from several languages as well um, to make sure we're inclusive across the board. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Mr. Goldstein. Yes, I want to commend the team and the proposal. Awesome. This is very exciting uh, development and just uh, had a question about the sustainability component. And um, if you're envisioning uh, for these photovoltaics, uh, an array uh, in a field like orientation, do you see these being installed on all the homes? Um, really like the idea that this is a living lab and it seems like a wonderful opportunity to promote um, sustainability and net zero uh, to other communities. Yeah, so, um, you know, and regarding photovoltaics, we think that it is market feasible to require all buildings to not only be solar ready, but to install um, solar panels on the roofs. We are not, you know, there, there was discussion about the possibility of doing a huge solar array on the site. Um, we don't feel that that makes sense from a land uh, use utilization standpoint, it would just take up a lot of land. But if we create on virtually every rooftop, the potential for solar energy, we think that that would go a long way in, in getting us toward carbon neutrality to, on the, in, in terms of energy. Um, we're also really excited about the potential of geothermal. Um, and uh, there have been projects that have now uh, have shown that you can do this in a really economic fashion. Uh, and so we're really interested in exploring that with the master developer uh, that, that the city selects um, you know, in the next phase of development. So those, those two things I think are going to be very important in getting us to carbon neutrality. I really commend you on that and think it's important for the city as we move forward um, to make these types of interventions and demonstrations. Members, any other questions for staff or the consultants? All right, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Del Castillo, Ms. Mr. Adams, Ms. Hale, Mr. Selman, and I don't think we heard from Ms. Trollson today, but I think she was was mentioned. Thank you so much for a great thank presentation. You. We really do appreciate it. Um, I don't see anyone here from the public who's here to comment in person. Mr. Price, there's no one who signed up to speak online. So um, that will conclude this item, which um, leaves us with approvable minutes. I understand, Mr. Price, that there's a slight correction that needs to be made. So that 
It hasn't been made yet, but it, it will. And can you just explain what that correction will, will be? Uh, one of the um, uh, committee members was present, but just recused for that item. A conflict on on vocab. Okay, can you remind me the? It's Ms. Runkel. So, can I get a motion to approve the minutes subject to that correction being made? Okay. We have a motion okay. by Commissioner Carpenter, seconded by uh, Commissioner Anderson. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 The motion carries. Right. I think that is our last item of business. So it is 10.05 a.m. in the meeting of the Comprehensive Land Use Plan Committee is adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Y'all have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think we technically have to vote to okay. adjourn. No, no, I mean, on the Hensley Field. Plan. We're not taking a, we weren't taking a vote today. Will we take a vote on it?